Lamarckism. Let's say you're born with a tail, but as you grow older, you realize this tail has no purpose. For monkeys, it's a different story because their tails help them balance and grab onto branches. In your case, it's just a useless accessory that you never used. So your DNA decides to skip the tail in your children's generation. That's basically what Lamarckism is all about. This theory of evolution revolves around the two main principles of use and disuse and the inheritance of acquired traits. For example, because a giraffe lives on a diet of leaves that grow high up in the trees, it relies heavily on its long neck. According to Lamarckism, this giraffe will pass its long neck on to the next generation. Think of it as going to the gym. You lift weights to get super buff. This theory, however, believes that your kids will come out of the womb with baby biceps that make them look like they had a womb gym in their mom's belly. People accepted this theory during the 19th century because it made sense for organisms to pass on the traits they use the most. However, Charles Darwin's natural selection eventually proved this theory wrong. Natural Selection The theory of natural selection basically says that we are all in the longest running season of Survivor, where every living thing competes in a never-ending reality show where you live or die. And instead of voting competitors out, nature decides whether you get to stay. Natural selection is like nature's quality control process. It's the way species adapt over time to their environment. Imagine a group of rabbits in a forest. Some have short legs, while others have long, strong legs. If a fox comes along, which rabbits do you think will escape faster? It's the ones with the longer legs who are going to outrun the fox, all while the ones with shorter legs become lunch. Meanwhile, the fast rabbits survive and celebrate their victory by making love with other rabbits to pass their long-legged genes to the next generation. Over time, most of the rabbits in that forest will likely be the speedy kind, all thanks to this survival of the fittest scenario. Now, fittest doesn't mean the strongest or the ones with bigger muscles. It's not like a nature-themed gym contest where bears bench press boulders or kangaroos have six-packs. Instead, it's more like how you're suited to your environment. For example, being fit in the Arctic means having the thickest fur. Meanwhile, in a desert environment, being fit means knowing how to conserve water. Natural selection is all about these little differences giving some individuals a better shot at surviving and reproducing. So this is important because natural selection dictates how you evolve. It tends to be slow, steady, and gradual, taking place thousands or even millions of years. Those who perform best in their environment in the long run get to pass on their genes, while the other Others, well, they get voted off the island. Mutation theory. Imagine evolution is a big recipe that's been going on for millions of years, but keeps adjusting over time. That's why mutation theory is the spice rack of evolution, as it talks about how these spices help mutate or change different organisms over time. A mutation is simply a typo in the genetic code, our biological instruction manual. When you make a small mistake in a recipe because of a typo, you might get a surprise flavor that changes the entire dish. A mutation, similar Similarly, can lead to new traits in an organism, and these traits can be anything from a change in color to new abilities. Sometimes these changes are beneficial, like adding a touch of spice to your dish that makes it taste better. Other times they might be neutral or even harmful. This theory explains these mutations can possibly lead to new species over time. It's like you keep changing a new recipe until it no longer resembles the original one. But mutation theory isn't as popular today as it once was because there hasn't been any evidence proving that a mutation can lead to the rise of a new species. Nowadays, scientists blend it with natural selection to try to explain evolution. Think of this theory as the chef, while natural selection is the food blogger deciding whether the dish is good. Gradualism. Think of evolution as the longest marathon ever, as every step you take eventually takes you to the end of the evolutionary cycle. Gradualism is like saying that this marathon happens steadily and leisurely, with small, steady steps instead of wild bursts of speed. The idea is that evolution moves slowly but surely over millions of years. This theory suggests that species evolve gradually through small, incremental changes. Think of it like a sculptor slowly chiseling away at a block of marble to create a masterpiece. Each tiny chip away doesn't seem like much, but you end up with something completely new over a long period. If you were to watch this process daily, it might seem like nothing is happening at all. But zoom out over thousands or millions of years, and you'll see that these little changes can add to big differences, like how a fish might eventually become a land-dwelling creature. Gradualism fits what we see in our fossil record. When you look at fossils, you'll see small progressive changes from one layer of rock to another. It's like looking at a flipbook animation where each page shows a slightly different version 
version of a creature, and when you flip quickly, you see the whole evolutionary journey. But like any marathon, there are different routes you can take. That means that while gradualism is a popular way to explain evolution, it isn't the only road to evolution. Punctuated Equilibrium Let's say you're watching a movie, and instead of a smooth storyline, you get sudden plot twists that instantly change the story. That's what punctuated equilibrium is all about. Traditionally, evolution was thought to happen gradually, like a slow drip of changes over millions of years. Picture a tortoise leisurely strolling across a field, and you get the classic gradualism model. But in 1972, scientists argued that evolution isn't always this slow and gradual process, because it can be more like a sprint with long periods of rest in between. The theory believes that some species are in stasis, which is a state where they barely evolve or change. It's like the human species the past few thousands of years. You can take a time machine to 3,000 years ago, and you'll find that there probably aren't any physical differences between you and your ancient cousins, and this stasis period can last millions of years. But when something dramatic happens, like a sudden change in the environment or the introduction of a new predator, your body can evolve and adapt quickly, resulting in a burst of evolutionary change over a short period. It's like attending a fitness boot camp, where you lose 30 pounds in 10 days because you're forced to cut your calories by half instantly. These bursts of change are the punctuated part, and the long periods of little to no change are the equilibrium. Synthetic Theory of Evolution Imagine the world of evolution as a giant buffet, with various dishes ranging from spicy to sweet. The synthetic theory of evolution is kind of like mixing the best ingredients from all those dishes to form a new but complete meal. This theory puts together Charles Darwin's ideas about how living things change over time and Gregor Mendel's discoveries about how traits are passed down from parents to their children. Darwin said that living things change because of natural selection. This means that the traits that help them survive and have babies get passed on. It's kind of like a recipe where only the best ingredients keep getting used over and over. Mendel's work showed that traits are passed down through genes, like special recipe cards for each living thing. Before this theory, people knew that living things changed over time and that natural selection was a part of it, but they didn't know how genes worked in that process. It was like knowing you need sugar to make a cake taste good, but not knowing how the sugar changes the cake's texture. This theory brings these ideas together. It tells us that evolution happens through genetic changes and how they're passed on through reproduction. It also considers how populations evolve, not just individual organisms. So it's like saying not only does the cake recipe change, but so does the entire cake baking process over time. Endosymbiotic theory. The endosymbiotic theory is like the ultimate version of an awkward first date. Imagine the Earth billions of years ago, when the only organisms were single-celled entities floating like blobs. Then one tiny cell decided to get up close and personal with another, invading its personal space. But instead of digesting the other cell as food, which usually happens, they started living together, one inside the other. This was the start of a revolutionary partnership that may have contributed to evolution. The big cell got to use the tiny cell's super cool photosynthesis skills, which help make food from sunlight. The tiny cell liked having a safe place to live inside the big cell. They figured that living together was better than going solo. This roommate arrangement became more than just convenient, but a deeper partnership that made it impossible for the cells to live without each other. The tiny cell became the mitochondria and chloroplasts, which are like the power plants and solar panels of cells. Scientists found clues that support this idea. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA, which is different from the cell's DNA and looks like the DNA of certain bacteria. They also have two layers of membranes, which might come from the time they were first swallowed. So the endosymbiotic theory is like the best cell friendship ever, which turned into a permanent partnership and helped create the more complex cells we have today. Neutral theory of molecular evolution. Consider evolution a game where genes compete to make it to the next round. Now the classic idea is that only the strongest and most advantageous genes make it through, but the neutral theory throws in a plot twist. It says that most of the genetic changes that happen are actually neutral, like backstage workers moving props around rather than the actors on stage. The theory suggests that many mutations don't really impact an organism's ability to survive or reproduce. These changes are, in essence, neutral because they're neither beneficial nor harmful. Imagine you're wearing a pink shirt instead of a blue one. Sure, it might affect whether or not you attract a girl, but it doesn't affect your ability to survive your day. That's what this theory is saying. Similarly, many changes in DNA don't affect an organism's fitness. They're more like genetic shrug moments, in that they happen, but they don't necessarily push evolution forward or hold it back. So if most of these genetic changes are neutral, you might 
wonder why they still spread throughout the population. This is where genetic drift comes in. Imagine you're playing a game where everyone picks random cards from a deck, and sometimes you get a cool card by sheer luck. Even though these cards don't really change the rules of the game, they still end up in everyone's hands. This is kind of how genetic drift works. It's like a random lottery where some genetic changes just spread by chance. Over time, these random changes build up, and that's why different species can end up looking or acting differently, even if it wasn't because they had to adapt. The neutral theory doesn't say natural selection isn't important, it argues that much of the genetic variation we see today is due to these random neutral changes. It's like saying that not every detail of a masterpiece painting was planned by a painter, but were merely accidental details painted into the canvas for the heck of it. Out of Africa theory. Imagine yourself as an ancient human living in Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago. You and the other homo sapiens were just hanging out in that region that's essentially called humanity's cradle of civilization. But you planned on going on a really long road trip, and that's where the out of Africa theory can be traced. This theory simply suggests that all modern humans have their roots in Africa. Our great 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 and even more great grandparents lived their best lives in Africa before deciding to pack up and explore new territories. Think of it like a massive family reunion in Africa. And then some brave souls said, hey, let's go on a cross-country journey. The journey began around 70,000 years ago. Small groups of humans started migrating out of Africa, driven by curiosity, food, climate changes, or even a desire for adventure. These early explorers walked, hunted, gathered, and traveled across the Middle East, into Europe and Asia, and eventually spread throughout the world, even reaching places like Australia and the Americas. The out of Africa theory is like the GPS of human history because it maps our journey. Science even supports this theory with evidence. For instance, when you look at ancient fossils and modern human DNA, you'll notice a pattern. The oldest fossils of Homo sapiens are found in Africa, and genetic studies show that modern humans from all over the world have common ancestors that trace back to African roots. As these early humans traveled, they encountered other human species, like Neanderthals in Europe, or Denisovans in Asia. And as it turns out, our ancestors didn't just say a polite hello and move along, they intermingled, swapped stories, and even genes. So you might be a product of an inter species romance that happened thousands of years ago. The out of Africa theory may also suggest that we're relatives from thousands of generations ago, so you might want to help a brother out by subscribing to our channel and joining our discord. Symbiogenesis. The story of evolution is not a solo performance, but an epic duet or even a jam session between different species. That's basically what symbiogenesis is about. This theory proposes that new species can arise from merging different organisms through symbiosis, which is when two organisms live closely together and benefit from each other. Think of it like a biological tag team where everyone wins. Imagine you and your friend getting together to form a band because you know that you have an awesome singing voice and your friend has great guitar skills. Together, you achieve something neither of you could have done alone. In the biological world, certain organisms, especially microorganisms, can merge or work together to create new, more complex life forms. So rather than gradual changes over time, symbiogenesis emphasizes sudden leaps in evolution through partnerships because as they realize they could be better off working together instead of evolving independently. This concept challenges the traditional Darwinian view of evolution, focusing more on competition and individual survival. It highlights the importance of cooperation and merging in the evolutionary process. It is similar to how content creators realize they could create better content by sharing their ideas and expertise through collaboration. Catastrophism. Imagine the Earth as a giant, ever-changing drama. Catastrophism is like the dramatic plot twists in this global soap opera. This theory suggests that the major changes we see in Earth's geology and life forms weren't just the result of slow, gradual processes, but rather came from sudden, cataclysmic events. It's like a movie suddenly shifts from a peaceful village to a huge volcano eruption. A long time ago, scientists found out that some fossils, which are like the remains of ancient animals, showed up in certain rock layers, and then suddenly disappeared. They came up with a theory called catastrophism. It's like saying that these fossils went away because of big disasters, like giant floods or huge volcanic eruptions, kind of like nature pressing the reset button. The big idea here is that these huge world-shaking events were the main drivers behind Earth's surface changes and species extinction. Think of it as Earth's way of having a giant cosmic sneeze that reshapes landscapes and wipes out life. The theory says that things can go kaboom to shake up the entire world. This theory revolutionized how science looks at the evolution of life on the planet. Before, the popular belief was that Earth's features were shaped slowly and steadily. 
But instead of slow and steady, catastrophism is more like the Fast and the Furious, wherein the planet has its fair share of both action scenes. Gaia Hypothesis Imagine yourself as the Earth. You know what you must do to care for yourself, as you eat properly, drink plenty of water, and rest regularly. That's what the Gaia Hypothesis proposes, as Earth is believed to be this massive being that knows how to self-regulate. The theory states that Earth is a living system with different parts that work together to keep things in balance. Just like your body maintains its temperature and pH levels to stay healthy, Earth's systems might be doing the same thing. Think of it as Earth's way of giving itself a spa day, but instead of facials and massages, it's balancing gases and temperatures. You know that your body has different organs that keep you running smoothly. Gaia suggests Earth has similar organs, like oceans, forests, and the atmosphere, that interact to maintain conditions for life. For example, plants and algae are like Earth's personal trainers, because they produce oxygen so we can breathe and help manage carbon dioxide levels. Kind of like keeping Earth's greenhouse gas diet in check. After all, no one likes a planet that's too hot to handle. The Gaia hypothesis doesn't say Earth is alive in how we think of animals and humans. Still, it proposes that life and the environment are so interconnected that they act almost like a single living system. The idea is that life itself can influence and maintain the conditions necessary for its survival, kind of like Earth's own feedback loop. Now, the evolution part of this theory comes in the form of how Earth self-regulates, adjusting its temperatures and carbon dioxide levels to suit the changing needs of the organisms living in it. So, how its different parts interact contributes to the small and incremental changes that the different species on the planet go through regularly. Essentially, Earth is responsible for regulating evolution as well. It's a bit like Earth having its built-in system to keep things running smoothly, like a cosmic self-care routine.